Good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome Scott. Thank you for being here with us today. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to meet you. So thanks. Thanks I, so much, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, how are you today? I'm good. Just uh, going through the process of, you know, relearning a lot of the music that, that we're going to play on the tour. And because, uh, you know, I'm leaving in about um, less than two weeks. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm practicing a lot, you know, getting ready to play every night and uh, getting a lot of stuff, you know, the stuff you have to do before you leave. For, this is a long tour, two months. So, wow. If I have to do before I leave. So, I'm busy. It's a busy time. Okay, so, and did you already start rehearsing for the tour, or are you? We're not really going to rehearse because we know the music. We okay, have to, we have to practice individually, but we we don't need to rehearse. We've we've played these songs before many times. Okay, I'm sure we'll have a great chat tonight. We'll we'll talk uh, a little bit about your new record, Carnival, which is to be released on February the second mm -hmm, this Friday. And yes. And I like to start um, to break the ice with the first question and uh, ask you a little bit about the title Carnival, because I think it is quite evocative. Uh, it suggests diversity and perhaps a touch of eclecticism. And how did the concept of the record uh, come about? Did you begin with the idea of depicting a carnival no, and build no. from there? Or did no, you start to I, tell, no. tell me? No, I never do that. I just write music. <laughs> And, okay. And and the, I I have no concept in mind or I have nothing. I'm just writing one tune at a time. And okay. I have no idea, you know, what the accumulation of those tunes is going to sound like. It, it, once I actually wrote more music than I needed for this album, and I and I picked the best of the songs that I I liked, the songs that I thought fit together more. And the songs okay. I use, I'll hopefully use on the next album. So, okay. so, so I never think about concepts. I think the only time I ever had a concept for an album in my whole career was Dog Party, because I knew okay. that was going to be an album about dogs. That's all I knew. You know, I knew the lyrics were going to be all dog related, and that's uh -huh. new. But when I write, I just write for the song, and that's that's it. And then when the song is done. I listen to it and I try to imagine what that song makes me feel, you know, and the title cut, that particular song made me think of a carnival for some reason. There's a, there's a little drum snare drum, uh, groove in there. That's kind of like a Fox trot. It kind of reminded me of horses, Uh huh. horses kind of reminded me of a merry-go-round, you know, and I thought. The whole thing kind of just reminds me of a carnival and I don't really know why, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's kind of a happy tune, but it's also kind of creepy and it's kind of eclectic and weird. And uh -huh. I, yeah, that's kind of like a carnival, you know, especially the ones I go to here in LA, because they're, if they're, if there's anything, they're creepy, <laughs> you know, and they're, <laughs> they're funny and creepy at the same time. So a that's lot of types of people go there. You know, and and it's a lot of diversity. You know, you can go on rides that scare the shit out of you, or you can go on rides that are so funny, like the haunted houses where everything is broken and nothing uh -huh. works. You know, yes, and, uh, it's just comedy. So yeah, I and, and and that's how it is, sort of for every tune. I I think of you know what does it remind me of, and and that's how I come up with the titles. Sometimes it takes weeks of listening to a song just every once in a while. And what's the first thing that comes into my mind when I listen to the song? And and sooner or later, I find titles for the tunes. That's pretty interesting. I I would have never thought about that. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you that because the common thread I observed as a listener in this record is that kind of like an exposition where each song uh, creates a unique setting uh, similar to the different stalls and see sceneries at a carnival. You know, there is uh, this, uh, the listener is, uh, it, for the listener, it's like taking a walk through mm -hmm. uh, an exposition. There is the carousel, as you said, in the title track, the ghost train uh, or in haunted bar room, uh, the roller coaster in sky coaster. And would you like to tell us about, you were already introducing this topic, but 
Would you like to discuss your approach to composing instrumental music? Have there been any major changes in it uh, throughout um, your career? Yeah, there there have been, but I would call them not really big changes because the way I've written music and the way I've always conceived of writing music is to have a groove first because it's, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to compose rhythmic ideas or any kind of melody ideas if you don't know what the tempo of the song is going to be then how could you possibly compose a melody if you don't even know the tempo of the song so i like to have a drum groove going um just that's the first element is to know what kind of song is this is it a, is it a shuffle is it a funk tune is it a ballad is it fast is it slow you know is it a medium tempo is it swing or is it straight you know it's it's th this kind of stuff all determines what you're going to write so the drum groove kind of says it all that's what the tune really is is the yes. groove and then i might just uh some sometimes i like to just compose with my voice um i might have a a, a drum groove and the tempo might be here and then i might just close my eyes and imagine a band on stage and sing and just go da 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 whatever you know just rhythms that are popping into my head because of my rhythmic vocabulary from listening to music you know all these years and then later I can go back and find notes and chords for those rhythms that I sang. So that's uh -huh. one way to do it. Another way to do it is just to jam with your instrument, whether you're a piano player, a guitar player, whatever, just play and record yourself playing. And if you record yourself playing for an hour and you go back and listen to it later, you'll probably hear at least two or three ideas or maybe more that you can use for melodies or you might come up with a great idea for a melody for a song just by accident, just from improvising. So yes. people that can improvise and people that are good improvisers, they're they're usually, you know, like they have a, an easier time coming up with compositional ideas because all they have to do is improvise and they they have a if they especially if they have a lot of vocabulary. Um, but then again, on devil's advocate on the on the other side of that sometimes people that are really good at improvising don't have the patience to be composers because they want instant gratification like they would get from playing a solo and composing music is really hard you don't always like what comes out and you have to mold it just like a painting you have to work with it for sometimes a really long period of time like a sculpture you know if you're chipping away at a sculpture and you make a mistake you don't just throw the whole thing away you have to fix it somehow so anytime I'm working on a tune, I, even if it takes me a month, that's the process. Sometimes you can't always be happy with it at first. You have to keep working on it and it requires patience. And some people just don't have the patience. It's uh -huh. not that they don't have the talent for it. I think they just don't have the patience for it because it's a lot of work. Yes. So you, I, I, I mean, you have learned to trust your instinct. You have a trained instinct as an improviser and as a composer. I, so, yeah, I mean, yes. I think that's that that kind of su sums it all. Well, about. sometimes you don't, sometimes you can't really trust yourself sometimes when you're in the act of doing it. Like, just like live, when you're playing on stage, you might mm -hmm. play a solo and while you're playing that solo, you might think you're playing great, but you listen to it later and you go, hmm, that wasn't that really that good, wasn't my best. And opposite, okay. you might be playing a solo and think it's not that good and listen to it later and go, wow, I don't know why I didn't think that it was good because in hindsight, I like it. And it can be the same for a composition. You can write something one day, come in the next day and hate everything you wrote and throw a lot of it away. And or vice versa, you can write something that you're not really sure that you're going to like and you don't think it's very good and come in the next day and hear it with fresh ears and you really mm -hmm. like. It. So it's it's an ongoing process that takes time, multiple listens, you know, 
uh, your ears are different on different days. You hear things differently on different days. So, you know, that's what, where you have the element of time in your favor. You're not in a hurry unless mm -hmm. you're being paid to do a project that has to be done on a schedule. And I'm not on a schedule. I've got all the time in the world to, to get it right before I decide to put it out. So this music you're listening to has gone through many, many, many levels of change before it finally arrives. As a great friend of mine always puts it, beautiful things deserve time. <laughs> and I think this, and I think this album uh, really exemplifies this concept. And uh, talking, uh, always talking about this album, one of the aspects that I particularly enjoyed is the co-presence of steering songs like Sky Coaster and also more thoughtful and suggestive moments like uh, See Around Us or my personal favorite, which is Greeny Mansion. Mm -hmm. And uh, they complement each other. They describe a story from different points of view. And you uh, kind of uh, answered this question, but if you like to uh, go a little bit deeper, what is, uh, how is the selection process uh, for you while creating the set list? Um, you said that there were songs that were left off the record. Mm -hmm. And how did you choose whether a song will be on the record or not? If it, if I feel like, well, the, the number one is if a song is too similar to another song okay. in any way, in in groove or in 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 the way in harmony, you know, sometimes there's a lot of harmony going on. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's just one chord vamps going on. And I've always thought that it's nice to have a balance between um, harmony and simplicity you know um i think it's one of the things that made weather report so great because joe's yes. type of composition was basically not all the time because joe could also write amazing harmonic tunes but he also loved to write these one chord vamps you know just kind of looping kind of tunes more groove oriented or more closer to world music and wayne's thing has always been about chords you know just chords on top of chords on top of chords but the combination of those two guys writing, both writing for the same record, made for some very cool albums. And and um, what I learned from that is, I mean, to me, sometimes I feel like if you've got an album with too much harmony, it can just maybe create a little bit of, um, maybe an album that's a little bit too challenging to listen to. Because after you've heard so many chords, it gets tiresome sometimes it can right so it's nice to give the listener a break from those all that harmony and just groove on one chord for a while and just let things settle down before you go into another big harmonic yes thing so so you know uh, arranging the album one of the main things for me was trying to create that balance from tune to tune not having too much harmony going on or too much in one key and the set list makes a huge difference like the order of the songs and that also applies to a live show mm -hmm. you know I, I i i wonder sometimes when i go see a band and i hear them play the first song and then they play the second song and it's the same exact tempo and i go what are these guys thinking like you know the audience has heard this tempo they don't want to hear it again you know they want to hear it different tempo and a different groove but for the next song you got to mix it up you know to, to keep people interested so and it's the same for an album you know the the tempos um the amount of harmony all that stuff uh is important when like you know arranging the order of the songs on an album okay i think that's that's a wise advice for young musician for to, to you know to to put together their set list for the album because yeah. I think that's an important thing that's something that I uh, cherish in an album to have variety and to have diversity but also like something that keeps me hooked and interested throughout the the, the listening process yeah I hope and, that's what I do I can't guarantee it because I hear we we hear differently than we all uh, hear differently so 
what one guy might think is a, a good a great job another guy might <laughs> find it boring you <laughs> you can't please everyone so yes i to do my best but the effect that i experienced uh, listening through this album was that one song uh requested me to go further further mm -hmm. and keep on listening so well, that, that i think that you achieved news. your your <laughs> i think you news. achieved that i, I goal. hope everybody feels like you do <laughs> And uh, one of the other aspects that I particularly liked is the ensemble sound in the album, which I found to be incre incredibly full, round, and powerful. Uh, during the recording process, did you and the other musicians follow any specific guidelines or use particular methods to achieve this sound? Was this a sound you were specifically aiming for? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by sound. Do you mean like sound as far as tones or sound as far as playing? I mean, as a band, you know, the sound. Are oh, you talking the, about the, the playing more than yes. the tones? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the playing is just, we've been playing these tunes on the road for two tours. Okay. So when we go in the studio, for us, it's just another gig. You know, there's, it's not like we're doing anything different in the studio than we do live every night. Uh, We're, our objective is to have interaction, you know, between the okay. musicians. And that's the most important thing that people can hear that we're interacting and having a conversation, conversational playing. Some tunes don't require that. I mean, some, some songs, the solos are like, take a song like COVID vaccination. Um, that's a funk tune. If you destroy that groove with conversational playing, it will be out of context of the song. It's meant to be, just be like, a, it's almost a pop tune. It's just a funk tune, right? So it's not jazz. So you don't want to put too much jazzy playing into that song or it's not in context and it's no longer a funk song. So my solo on that song, the guys are just grooving behind me. So okay. I actually hated my solo on the the live version on, uh, in the studio i didn't like my solo at all so i played a new one when i overdubbed but it didn't matter because the guys are just grooving so you know they're not they're not reacting to anything that i play now there are other songs that they very much react to uh what i play those songs i can't change the solo because they reacted to it so mm -hmm. if i want to fix it i might be able to go in and fix it Or I could even learn it again and play it with better tone or play it on a different guitar. But I can't change it because it's a conversation with the guys. So it has to stay whether I like it or not. <laughs> yes. It's the way it is. It's a solo and the guys, the guys played what they played because of what I played. So if I change it, it doesn't make it won't make any sense. But I think there is beauty in that. You know, the, yeah, to, it's, to, it's to what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. to, to accept what what has come to you. Exactly. And, yeah. Yes. As we all do, being jazz musicians, and and uh, you know, I mean, I don't. I'm not really a jazz musician in the traditional sense of the word, but I have that that same spirit when when Absolutely. when I improvise. Um, it's all about connecting with the the people you're playing with and mm -hmm. playing with them and getting ideas off each other when we play. And hopefully that translated into this session. And and, and I definitely there are moments when it did. There's some of the songs that, that on the record where I thought, well, you know, we've actually played that song better live, but maybe that was because there was an audience, you know, because yes. the studio's different. You know, the studio's a different animal. There's no audience. It feels a little stiffer. It feels a little colder you know so it's difficult to go in the studio and get the same energy that you would have from a stage mm -hmm. so all you can do is do your best and that's it yes and talking about your tone you were mentioning tone in this album i found it uh, i mean in every of your albums is spot on but in this album it's quite dynamic perfectly integrated with the overall sound of the band and despite being a guitar trio there is an incredible richness and fullness to the sound could you discuss your choice of instruments for this record did you approach anything differently this time uh, compared to your previous works 
Um, no, I mean, I've just got a, I've got a lot of guitars and a lot of pedals and, and every time I, I'm going to do a new album, I buy a lot of new gear, like especially pedals and plugins. Cause I'm always looking for sounds that I haven't used before. So hopefully I found some new ones. Um, and, uh, but I, I did play a lot of guitars. I played mostly my Sir Strats, but some of them have Mike Landau pickups. Some of them have V60 pickups. So those are different. Makes the guitar sound a bit different, even though it still sounds like a Strat. There are some definitely tonal differences in those pickups. I use a Les Paul um, on at least three or four songs. I use my SG. Um, mm -hmm. I use my Dan Electro guitars. Like I have a Dan Electro electric sitar. I have the Dan Electro 59 electric Dobro, and I use those. I used acoustic guitars. I used my acoustic Dobro. So yeah, I'm trying to use every <laughs> There's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of guitars going on and a lot of different pedals and, and plugins and effects. Okay. But I mean, um, according to what you said before, uh, was there any uh, massive post-production uh, oh yeah, I mean, totally. Mix. Okay, it's all post production. <laughs> okay, I mean, if you heard this album with just the bare trio, it wouldn't sound anything like it sounds. Uh, there's there's probably seven eight guitars going on in every two. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they may be subtle. They might be back in the background, but they're there. And and okay. mixing is is an mixing is a real art form, and I'm lucky to work with an engineer who understands the subtleties of mixing because Alan Hertz has got amazing ears. Sometimes yes. he puts things that I have a little bit too loud, he puts them in the background more. And we sort of believe, and, and this is another thing I learned from working with Joe Zawinul, he, he, always, he always said, always have something in the music that's almost inaudible. It's really low in the mix. You won't notice it, but you'll notice if it's not there. It's, it's a subtle thing. It's a background thing. It's ambient. And it sort of pulls the listener in. They may not know quite what they're listening to because it's mixed so low in, in the background. But if you took it out, the song wouldn't sound the same. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on on this record as, as there was in People Mover, but maybe more on this record. There's a lot of background sounds that are just there. And... Um, one of the things I learned from, from Scott Kinsey, it's kind of a cool way to layer, um, is I would just pick a sound, not my normal guitar sound, but something very foreign to the guitar, like using a plug-in, um, using a, a weird pedal, but something that would make me play completely different than I normally play. And I would just improvise on a, open up a track and just improvise through the whole song using that sound and um and then do it again and again and again and have like four tracks of improvisation with this crazy sound and then go through those four tracks and find the little small things that i really like and place them in the song at the at the places where i played them or they don't really have to be chronological i could put them if i played it at the beginning of the song it might fit better at the at the end of the song so yes but it's just a way to get new things into the music that weren't there when you composed the song so in a way it's post composition and you know and post improvisation at the same time because it comes from improvising and then you get a, a second sound and a third sound and do the same thing again and just add these little little textural layers to what you're doing and they may be back in the background and maybe people aren't going to really notice them that much because they're not meant to compete with the main thoughts of the song, which would be the main melody or whatever. But they're there in the background and you they're, they're cool. They're just subliminal almost. They're, they're, they're very, um, you hear them subconsciously maybe. I could talk about this for hours because you you really opened uh, so many uh, landscapes for me about you know it's integrating. Fun, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a it's a you know I just look at it as is making like making a movie. You yes. know, special effects. There's multiple takes. There's you know it's so different than live playing. Um, it, it initially starts with live playing, 
And mm -hmm. that's the structure. That's the foundation of it is the live performance. But then you use the studio to layer stuff. And there's so many bands that have done it. I mean, I'm I'm nothing uh, unusual. I, I certainly didn't invent this. If you listen to a Led Zeppelin song, there's mm -hmm. like six guitars going on at the same time and a lot of that music. And Jimmy Page was a master of layering guitars on top of each other. And also something that I didn't know before is Richie Blackmore was also really, really into layering, but you don't hear it so much because Deep Purple had a keyboard player. So the organ kind of disguises some sometimes and what you think is just one guitar track is not. Um, and there I learned multiple. Okay. I was able to download, there's a, there's a website called Tracks for All and you can mm -hmm. download solo tracks from a lot of famous rock and pop bands, Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple. And so I I downloaded Deep Purple guitar tracks from about, I don't know, 10 songs or more. And on a lot of songs, there's like five guitars going on at the same time. And it's so interesting to listen, wow. to pan them left and right. And they tell you like, okay, this is the guitar left, this is the rhythm guitar right, lead guitar left, lead guitar right. And when you pan them and listen to them all at the same time with just guitar, no bass, no drums, no no keyboards, it's amazing that it's a huge sound. And maybe people don't realize that Deep Purple and Richie Blackmore was really into doing that. Um, he was recording like... Um, like that song space trucking you know doing it da, 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 right so he had he's on the left with a really bassy scooped sound it's like all bass and all treble yes then he's on the right doubling that with a really mid-rangey sound like he's got all the bass on the amp turned off and all the probably the mid-range on 10 and it's like so they're complementing each yeah, other but when you hear those two in stereo it sounds massive it just sounds yes. real big so you know these are just like age-old recording tricks that rock guitar players have been using since the 60s right and and so i'm not really doing anything new i'm just doing it m maybe more in a fusion <laughs> in a fusion context but it's definitely not new a lot of guys did this before me Okay, that that's quite interesting to know because I, I listened for it one more time and try to catch these little details that you put in there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like to talk a little bit about your experience as a teacher. Um, your deep roots in blues are well known, and storytelling, which is a key aspect of the of blues, I don't have to mention that, is prominent. Is really prominent in your playing. And today, many young musicians seem to focus more on skill than narrative. Yeah, that As is a... kind of sad, actually. Yeah, but yes. I would have to agree with that. The young, the young guys, I don't know what they're thinking. As um, a teacher and a, and a musician, what's your view on the importance of storytelling in music for young artists? Well, it's the most important thing, and and I think a student is only as good as his teacher. You know, yes. and, and and sometimes your teachers aren't real people, but they're just on your CDs. I always tell my students, I mean, we have a great faculty of teachers here at, at our school, but nobody plays, nobody here plays as good as John Coltrane. So if you want to learn, learn from John Coltrane, you know, transcribe John Coltrane. Don't listen to me. I don't play as well as him. So listen to him, you know, and I can guide you through that process but if you want to learn how to really be a great player, you have to transcribe all the genius players that came before us. And I've certainly done my share of transcribing and other players should too. So when I hear some of the guys who don't seem to have any sense of storytelling in their playing and they're just all about chops, then I would just have to say they've not been really listening to the players that I would listen to. You know, so I, I can't say that it's bad or good. It's just, it's just, it's not my personal taste. I'm not, I'm not about chops so much. I mean, it's good. It's fun. Sometimes it's fun to fly around the instrument, but if you make it only about that, you lose the other part, the melodic and the part, the soulful melodic part of your playing. 
And, and you got to have both. And I've seen yes. too many players that have the chops, but they're missing the other part. And perhaps it's just because they're not listening to the same players that I would choose to listen to. Like, and I can name a bunch of them. Um, Dexter Gordon. Um, yes. Jeff Beck. Um, Toots Thielmans. Uh, Thelonious Monk. Wayne Shorter. You know, the, these are people who, uh, Leslie West. You know, the, these are all people that played with more, an, a, a, it was more about emotion and a, more about melodic and motific playing than it was ever about chops. You know, mm -hmm. not that Oscar Peterson wasn't a great pianist, a completely different style than Thelonious Monk, who was more about quirkiness and being weird and playing these really textural things. In a way, I sort of see Bill Frizzell as the guitar version of Thelonious Monk, you know, kind of just textural and, and quirky and weird, not a bunch of chops, but you don't need chops when you have such creative ideas yes. as Bill has. So, you know, the, the, the players that play with a lot of chops, obviously they're not listening to those guys I just mentioned. They're listening to other players that, that, and that's who they want to pattern themselves after. They want to be chops guys. Like I said, I don't think it's good or bad. It's just my personal taste is not with the chops guys. My my uh, technique or any of that bullshit. I I couldn't care less about it. And I don't really care to hear those guys that do it. Because mm -hmm. it's like going to the circus. It's like, oh, that's really uh, amazing. I'll go next year. I don't want to listen to it every day. Whereas okay. I could put Stevie Ray Vaughan on and listen to him every single day and I would never get tired of it. So it's a different, it's a different thing. So, and, and it's all about personal taste and people that are hearing me talk right now shouldn't listen to what I'm saying because my opinion means nothing. You know, my opinion is just my own opinion of what I like. And I would never try to dictate what anyone else should like. You know, mm -hmm. if you like guys like, like say Guthrie Govan, who has amazing technique on the guitar and he's a, he's a brilliant musician. And if you like those style of players, that's great, you know, because I also think he's amazing. He's not one of my favorite guitarists because I would rather listen to Bill Frizzell. You know what I mean? It's just, that's just my yes. personal taste, but, but you know, our Schofield, who just plays these beautiful melodies and and never been a, a chops guy, he's more of a stylist, you know. And I kind of yes. like guys that are more about you know speaking with a personal voice and style than guys that are just playing a lot of fast notes all the time. That's just not not my thing. But like I said, it's that's just a personal thing. <laughs> never try to influence anybody else to listen to whatever you like it's all good it's all music but as i said storytelling is i think as you said and i definitely agree with you on this is should be um something that we should as a guitarist and as musicians uh cherish more and have a little yeah, bit more focus on one one of the things that i find kind of disheartening in the music world among younger players is I'm not hearing a lot of composing going on. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm hearing sort of very mediocre compositions like they were written on a napkin five minutes before the session. <laughs> you know, like nobody that's really put a whole lot of thought and time into into composing. Now there are a few, but they're few and far between. Most guys are so busy working on their chops and working on becoming great players that the sort of the art of writing and composing somehow has kind of got lost. Like look at, you know, like that's one of the reasons I love Led Zeppelin because the songs are so cool and, and it's not just about the playing, but it's also about the songs. And I, and I thought the same thing about groups like gentle giant and weather report and, you know, the, the compositional element of those bands, it's it's so strong and such an important part of the music. And that seems to not be as prevalent, uh, pre prevalent these days, seems to me. Like a lot of guys that can play, they say, well, now I can play really good, so I'm going to do an album, but 
I'm going to put about one twentieth of the effort into the songs that I put into my guitar playing. And I think they should try to even it out a little bit more. Put a little more less effort into your yes, <laughs> yes. A little more definitely into your into your tunes. <laughs> but that's Did just you create. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's just my take on it because uh, you know, it's it's. You know, I, I remember listening to a Joe Bonamassa record one time and man, it was just the first tune on the record. I was going, God damn, that's such a great song. I wish I wrote that. You know, I'm not hearing too much of things that are that cool and that interesting among the younger players, you know, as far as their songwriting goes. And, and that's one of the things like when I first heard this tune, I go, well, here's a guy Who's, who's putting some effort into his tunes, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I like that. And, and you know, some guys, they don't even write their own music, and that's cool, too. You know, Jeff Beck never wrote any of his own songs, but he hired great musicians to, to write. He's got a definitely, definitely got amazing <laughs> music catalog with a lot of amazing tunes written by uh, Jan Hammer and Tony Hymas and just great songs they even if they even if jeff himself didn't write them who cares because it's great music beyonce doesn't write her own songs either but she's got a great catalog of music because she hires a great writing team mm -hmm. so i think if i didn't know how to write i would hire people that do <laughs> that's for sure yes yeah. just like i can't sing so when i did a blues album i hired thelma houston Rather yes, the thing myself, because which would be a disaster. <laughs> what a great record that was! Well, that you was know, a great Thelma, record. Thelma's amazing. So, you know, uh, I I would never attempt to try to sing because that is yes. just my forte at all. Maybe for comedy's sake, it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> just to experiment. Yeah, just to Not make bad. people laugh. But uh, I think that's a great piece of advice that you gave us about you know uh, putting a little more uh, or a lot more effort into our tunes rather than our chops or not only into our chops but we you know i mean um the, the music that we compose is what is left behind us not I, our chops i so. think that's why jazz players are like traditional jazz players love playing standards because mm -hmm. if they don't want to be composers which obviously a lot of them don't why not play the most beautiful music from the past? Mm -hmm. Beautiful songs, you know, by Herbie, like Dolphin Dance or, or Stella by Starlight or these, you know, these beautiful songs that have been written before. Why not just say, OK, composing is not for me. That's not what I ever wanted to do. Instead, I'm going to play. I'm going to pick a repertoire from the most beautiful songs that have been written by great composers like Wayne Shorter and and you know all these other amazing composers that have composed an insanely great library of music that jazz players love to play so i would rather hear guys doing that than writing mm -hmm. tunes of, the, of yes. their own <laughs> yes because they are songs they are tunes yeah as you said. They're, and they're, they're great they're great they tunes. are great yeah. they are great yeah and and i think i have the last question for you which is the the big question uh -oh. and, uh, <laughs> I left Fair that for enough. last but uh, you know is a question for young musicians always recently me and my colleagues from music of young which is this community uh, of young musicians uh, spanning from uh, 16 to 28 uh, 30 years old actually uh, where we have the chance to cultivate relationships and get in contact and learn from some of the greatest musicians and coaches out there. We spent a week in Rome um, from uh, January the 2nd to January the 6th, actually, and we, had, uh, we, we explored the concept of the pursuit of uniqueness. Your work exemplifies innovation while always honoring your roots. You always keep an eye on what you did before on who you are can you share your journey to finding your unique voice the challenges you faced and how you define uniqueness in music well that that is a really difficult question to answer because and and some of it 
is hard to answer because you can't answer some things. Like I tell my students sometimes when they ask me, why did a composer pick this chord? There's no technical reason for it. It doesn't exist in music theory, a move from this chord to this chord. If you study classical music or if you study traditional music of any kind, you won't find an answer because it's it can't be explained with science because it's art. And art really can't be explained. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's yes. just, you can try to analyze it and you can learn from it but you can't really give a reason for some some things that happen in music other than that's what the composer heard in his head and that's just what he decided to choose any chord can go to any chord so the same kind of thing is is it a, that plot that analogy also applies to what you're asking finding a voice because it's different for everyone it like what i went through might not apply to anyone else it only applied to me and i can give you a very brief summary um and I make a long story short i started out playing rock and roll and blues influenced by led zeppelin which influenced me to find out where that music came from which led me way back to muddy waters and 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 john lee hooker and and albert king and 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 bb king and albert collins and all those guys who inspired Led Zeppelin and inspired those rock bands of the 60s. And then I was very lucky to get a gig with an all black group that played, it was a horn band, and all they played was music from Motown, um, James Brown, Cool and the Gang, Sly and Family Stone, um, just all that music, Tower Power, you know, a whole other side of music I didn't know much about, and I was just a kid. So I played with them for three years, almost four years. And I learned to love that music just as much Marvin Gaye, all this incredible music I'd never heard before. And I learned to love that music just as much as rock and blues. So that got me interested through bands like Tower of Power who were playing kind of jazzy solos. That that got me into listening to bands like Weather Report and, and, and Ma Vishnu Orchestra and bands like that. And the same thing with rock. I found out that those musicians started more in the jazz world. So by listening to Weather Report, I started listening to the music that inspired Weather Report, which was Miles Davis, John Coltrane. I started listening to nothing but bebop and, and, and really, really trying to learn as much as I could of the jazz, traditional jazz vocabulary by playing standards for many, many years, playing standards every day. It, it, with my students at home and just being immersed in that world of 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 straight ahead jazz and then I, I mean after so many years it's would be impossible if all those influence didn't come out in what i do now because i still love all that music the same in fact i'm probably one of the only musicians you could ask do you have a favorite kind of music and i would have to say no i don't I, I, I don't like traditional jazz any more than I like head banging rock and roll and, yes. and funky music like by James Brown. I love it all. So, and I would be, there's no way I could say I love one music more than any other. So what I play now is just a combination of all my influences. And when someone in their life, in their musical life has so many influences, or even if it's just two influences, they're going to sound like whatever combination, you know, of those influence make them sound of and and whatever they add to that vocabulary of their of their own, because we all have our own things that we add to stuff that we've learned, like Michael Brecker, for example, definitely Absolutely. hear Coltrane in, in Michael Brecker's playing. It, it sounds to me like Michael Brecker learned everything John Coltrane ever played, but then he added so much of his own vocabulary on top of that foundation. And, and I'm sure there are other saxophone players that he listened to as well. And that mix of players that he listened to, to uh, eventually you have Michael Brecker who sounds only like Michael Brecker. But you can definitely hear the influences in my playing. You can hear Jeff Beck. You can hear Richie Blackmore. 
You can hear a little bit of um, the Chet Atkins thing that I like to do when I play country licks, you know, and, and uh, you can, you can hear, uh, I've definitely learned a bunch of licks from Wes Montgomery. Uh, I've transcribed Pat Martino and Joe Pass and Joe DiOrio and these straight ahead jazz players, guitar players that I listen to, as well as many of the jazz horn players that I've listened to. So, mm -hmm. I mean, anybody that hears me play can clearly hear that I've listened to these guys and that's okay. You know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's okay for, for people to hear influences in your, in anybody's playing, but at the same time, you need to sound like you're you. So if you listen to too much of one guy, I mean, I definitely have students that all they listen to is John Schofield. When they play a solo, it's like John <laughs> Schofield's in the room. Yes. You know, yes. So I got to be careful. I don't want to listen to too much Sco because I've already listened enough to Sco. And there, you can also hear that in my playing as well. Because when I started playing jazz, Sco was like big on the scene. And I definitely transcribed some of his solos and I listened to him a lot. But I had to stop because I don't want to sound too much like John Schofield. So, you know, he's got a very identifiable voice. And so does Pat Metheny as well. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to too much Pat Metheny, then, you know, you've got a danger of sounding too much like. So better to take small amounts of influence from a big number of people than a big amount of influence from one person or just two people. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Did that even come close to answering your question? Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe because I got completely off track. I have no idea. Not, absolutely. You answered the question perfectly. That was a great question because what you said perfectly matched what you did. You became the best possible you through incorporating all these great influences that you had. But you we became all, the, the the best possible you. Well, I That's, don't know if it's the best. It's still a work in progress, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it's improving. But but I mean, we all are. It's just like you are what you eat. You are what you listen to. Yes. So when if you only listen to metal, then that's what you're going to sound like. That's what you're going to do. And that's cool. I don't really a lot of people sometimes think that I have something against uh traditional uh, tradition or guys that choose to just put all of their energy into one kind of music and i have absolutely nothing against that in fact i draw inspiration from those guys like eddie van halen had no interest in jazz whatsoever who the fuck cares that guy was like the greatest rock guitar player ever you know like he was just amazing chops soul eddie had it all you know, yes. so, so good for him that he just decided to be who he was and that he wasn't influenced. Didn't he, he didn't go get influenced by funk and Motown and, and, and jazz and fuck all that. Let him do what he does. You know what I mean? he was great at it. And I would say the same thing for the straight ahead jazz guitar players. They have no interest in rock. They have no interest in distortion. They have their hollow body, you know, gibson l5 and they play it through a polytone yes. amp and they don't do anything but play standards and play jazz and good for them it's like they're the people that the people like me draw inspiration from you know so i have nothing against those guys that they choose to do one kind of music and that's all they do and and they do it really really well and i think that's great you know that's, i'm not one of those guys i'm like a jack of all trades and master of none <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I think I think that uh, mm -hmm. what you answered before and right now really um, is a great answer to, to my question. And it's a great inspiration for me as an, an up and coming musician. And I, I hope for many of my friends, for many of your fans, we will listen to this interview. And I think it's the best way to conclude this chat with this Insp with this great inspiration from you and the other great things that you said uh, during this chat. Well, I, thank I, I appreciate. Um, I, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for, for you guys for having me on the show. And it it means a lot because, you know, I'm playing a kind of music that isn't really mainstream and it's not easy to get companies to promote 
and and have your back when it's mm-hmm. much easier to promote music that's much more mainstream and it's going to reach more, more people. So every bit of press really helps. And I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to, you know, to 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 plug my album. Go out and buy my album, everybody. Yeah, do it right <laughs> now. <laughs> it's a great album. Trust me. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone was uh, was listening to it. Thank you Scott. Uh, I repeat it's a, it's been an honor to have you here. It's been a pleasure to have all these great pieces of advice from you. I felt I feel like I am enriched after this uh, well, conversation so we much. had. Nice and I hope uh, thank you. <laughs> I hope everyone who will hear this interview will feel uh, much as much as I enriched as I do. So thank, thank you, you. so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I wish you a good evening and okay, everyone guys. go listen to uh, the new Scott Anderson's record right now. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Okay, ciao guys. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>